Now, there are many aspects of the book I could talk about this morning, and our time is limited, so I thought I would focus only on one thing. The one thing is how George Kennan saved the world. I don't mean this literally, but I do mean that the Cold War could have been much worse. The Cold War could have been a hot war. Welcome to the Miller Center Forum. From the University of Virginia, I'm Doug Blackman. Our guest today is the eminent American historian John Lewis Gaddis, whose work on the Cold War and its origins has for decades been at the vanguard of our evolving understanding of that critical period in American history. The acclaim for his work began at the beginning of his career and has continued throughout, beginning with a Bancroft Prize for his first book in 1973 and a litany of honors in the years since, culminating this year with the applause for his most recent book, George F. Kennan, An American Life, which won both the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Pulitzer Prize. Professor Gaddis' achievement as Kennan's biographer occurs on many levels. On one, he has written an incisive and intimate portrait of the mind and life experiences of a singular man who was perhaps the most accomplished student and practitioner of diplomacy, political science, and history of his time a Foreign Service officer and strategist who, before almost any others, brilliantly, if imperfectly, comprehended the course of events and forces at play, which would ultimately and inevitably resolve the impossible coexistence of the two great new empires of the 20th century, the Soviet Union and the United States. Yet on another level, Professor Gaddis' book is an extraordinary depiction of the American century and the American story. The narrative of a nervous new nation rising often with uncertainty to its new status as a global superpower, all seen through the lens of a nervous Midwestern boy who over the span of 101 years was both witness and a forceful player in the greatest dramas of his time from Germany's annexation of Austria and Czechoslovakia to the spread of Soviet power across Eastern Europe and Asia, to the disarmament debates of the 1980s, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and ultimately, the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Please welcome Professor John Gaddis. Doug, thank you um, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. It's great to be back at the Miller uh, Center. Doug, congratulations on your own Pulitzer a few years back. Uh, honored to be introduced by you. I want to um, say some words about this biography, which has itself an interesting uh, history. And then, of course, leave time for questions. I might just start out by, um, by pointing out that the subject of authorized biography, the collaboration of a biographer and the subject of his um, biography, has become a, a news item in recent <laughs> weeks. And so I thought I would start out by talking about uh, the nature of authorized <laughs> biography, or particularly the nature of this authorized uh, biography, which is somewhat different from uh, what's been in the news uh, in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, George Kennan was 78 years old when um, my book, Strategies of Containment, uh, came out. Uh, George liked that book. I was a very junior academic at the time and found myself unexpectedly getting fan mail from George Kennan, handwritten fan mail, letters that kept coming saying, you have understood my views better than anyone else ever has. Uh, I would say thank you. He would say, you underlined or in capital letters have understood my view. I, thank you very much, I would say. It finally occurred to me, perhaps he was angling for a biographer. And so in 1981, I wrote him and said, Professor Kennan, is anyone doing your biography? And he wrote back, 
I, I think not quite honestly and said that it had never occurred to him <laughs> that anyone <laughs> would wish to do his biography. But now that I had brought it up, uh, perhaps we should talk about it. Uh, and so we did, and so fairly quickly we came to an agreement on what an authorized biography would really mean. It would mean that I would have his full cooperation uh, in terms of interviews, in terms of access to his diaries and papers that were not open to other uh, scholars, that I would have access to his family, to his colleagues, most of his uh, important colleagues from the early Cold War were still very much alive uh, in, in those days. But that all of this would be private and confidential until after his death so that uh, both uh, his own privacy could be respected in this regard, but also so that I would have the freedom to say what I thought. And the understanding was that he would never read a single line of what I wrote. So that was the deal we made in 1981. Uh, he was 78. We expected that maybe it would be 10 years or so before the um, biography came out. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, he lived, as Doug says, to be 101. He did not die until the year 2005. And so part of the history of this book is the long time to completion. Um, I was uh, calculating the other day that um, um, it took um, uh, Boswell uh, quite a long time, was uh, Johnson, Dr. Johnson's uh, authorized biographer. I was Kennan's uh, Boswell longer than Boswell was Johnson's Boswell, you know, <laughs> because of how long it took uh, to produce uh, this book. Uh, and periodically, in the final decade or two of this, almost every year it was a ritual, I would get uh, uh, phone calls, uh, apologies, letters uh, from George for delaying the biography. Uh, <laughs> Tony and I would go to see the Kennans in Princeton and Tony would be taken uh, out into the backyard with George's wife, Annalisa, to see the roses. And George would take me into the living room and say mournfully, I'm so sorry, it can't be much longer now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> This accounts for uh, the long uh, uh, gestation period of this biography, which actually caused my students, uh, I discovered, to begin taking bets as to who was going to live longer, uh, <laughs> subject to my biography or the biographer uh, himself. So that's the history of this particular authorized biography. Uh, I think in retrospect, I know in retrospect that I was extraordinarily fortunate in having this relationship uh, with uh, George Kennan, in having the access that this arrangement granted me, in having the luxury whenever I came to a puzzling document of being able to call him up and say, what did you mean uh, here? Or why did you do this? Uh, and George was always forthcoming, <coughs> and until very late in his life, uh, fully cogent and able to discuss these matters uh, with great precision. So it was an extraordinary uh, situation for a young scholar to fall into, and it was an extraordinary experience as an old scholar, finally, to finish and publish <laughs> uh, the book. Now, there are many aspects of the book that I could talk about this morning, and our time is limited, so I thought I would focus only on one thing and then take questions. Um, the one thing is how George Kennan saved the world. I thought that would be uh, large enough uh, for the next 15 minutes uh, or so. I don't mean this literally. I mean it, of course, with a certain amount of poetic license, but I do mean that the Cold War could have been much worse. The Cold War could have been a hot war uh, on the scale of uh, World War I or World War II, except that we all know that it would not have been on that scale. It would have been on a much more massive and disastrous scale <clears throat> because of the presence of nuclear weapons on both sides. So we are extremely fortunate uh, that this war remained cold and not hot. And the question of how that happened is a question that many of us have wrestled with. Some in this room, uh, Mel Leffler, Mark Silverstone sitting over there have wrestled with this in their own scholarship. I've done so uh, as well. But it seems to me one important element of this discussion has to do with the history of 
an idea. How did the idea develop that there could be a long Cold War, which would at the same time never erupt into a hot war? There had not really been that kind of relationship before between great antagonistic powers, or at least people were not aware of such relationships. At the end of World War II, there seemed to be only two options available, one of which was to uh, treat uh, Stalin as Hitler uh, and to prepare for World War III. And many uh, American planners uh, were seeing that as the only available option in 1945-46. The other possibility, very much discussed in this period, was appeasement of the Soviet Union to try to attempt with Stalin what had failed with Hitler in the uh, 1930s. But neither of those were particularly attractive uh, options. It was Kennan who, in his, uh, from his perch in Moscow uh, in 1946 as the number two in the Moscow embassy, uh, and then being brought home uh, to uh, convey his views uh, within Washington policy circles in the rest of 1946 and early 1947, came up with um, a third way, a third idea, a third alternative to these unpalatable alternatives. This was the idea uh, of containment. The idea was that um, time was on our side, uh, we being the West in this situation. If we could simply hold the line, if we could keep the Soviet Union from expanding its influence any further than it had expanded with the end of World War II, if we could rehabilitate Western Europe, regain Western self-confidence, rebuild democracy and capitalism from the uh, insults, from the disasters that it had, they had suffered in the 1930s, then in time, the Soviet Union itself would come under strain, under pressure, from the internal contradictions that existed within that system. Marx and Lenin talked frequently about the internal contradictions of capitalism that would bring it to a position of collapse. It was Kennan who stood Marx and Lenin on their heads and said the more significant contradictions are the internal contradictions of communism itself in its relationship to the country in which it has taken root or is attempting to take root, that is Russia. And so it was these contradictions that led Kennan to believe that if time could be bought, if patience could be maintained, then in time, the uh, Russian people themselves and perhaps even the Soviet leadership would come to see the unworkability of their system and the need to change it uh, from within. Now, this is a pretty good prediction of what would actually happen, how the Cold War would actually end. Um, but I got interested in the course of writing this book <clears throat> in the question of where this idea came from, where Kennan's optimism about the possibility for change in Russian society uh, might have come from. And I thought about the study of Russian history. I know, knew that Kennan had studied this fairly thoroughly. I thought about the relationship of this to international relations uh, theory, but I was not really convinced that international relations theory was much of a guide uh, in this regard as well. So I really began looking particularly in the period 1945-46 at the roots of Kennan's thinking, what was it that influenced him in coming up with the idea of containment, uh, and particularly coming up with the optimism sufficient to think and to convince others that containment might actually work? And the answer, somewhat to my surprise, is literature. This is one of the best arguments that I have seen for reading great works of literature, great novels, great plays, great short stories. Which ones do I mean? Well, obviously I mean the great literary works of 19th century Russia. The young Soviet experts in the Foreign Service were encouraged when they went into that profession in the 1920s to train by learning the language first and then by reading the great literature. Not the literature of the Soviet period, but the literature of the Tsarist period to read.
Pushkin and Gogol and Dostoevsky and Turgenev and Tolstoy and Chekhov. Uh, and uh, this is what they did in their training. And I'm convinced that it had a payoff in Kennan's own thinking. Because what it opened for him was a window into the deep culture of Russia, a culture so deeply rooted that the success of the Bolshevik Revolution was really a transitory phenomenon in the long sweep of Russian history, uh, a culture so deeply rooted that in the long run it would resist the artificial imposition of a system which was, after all, imported from uh, Western Europe. Marxism was something that was developed as an explanation of how European uh, economies and political systems uh, would work, <coughs> as an explanation of how industrial systems would work, ill-fitted to the peasant character, uh, the agricultural character of Russia itself. Uh, and so Kennan's instinct from his deep reading of Russian literature was that this system simply would not fit. Russian culture, Russian national character, something that's really fairly unfashionable to talk about in universities these days, but for Kennan it was immensely important. Russian national character uh, had not changed. Now how did he know this? Well, he knew it, I think, from the combination of the reading that he did, but also the experiences that he had in traveling around Russia, which he did to the maximum possible extent allowed by wartime conditions and by the restrictions of the secret police. But one of the most revealing episodes, I think, in his mind was a trip that he took to Siberia in June of 1945. It's one month after the war has ended in Europe. George is trying to retrace the route of his famous ancestor, the first George Kennan, the explorer of Siberia, the author of Siberia and the Exile System, 1891. Uh, the younger George Kennan had never been to that part of the world, and so he negotiated with the authorities' permission to get on the train from Moscow in June of 1945 and travel about halfway across. He got as far as Novosibirsk. It took four days on the train uh, to get there. He was able to tour a collective farm and some of the industrial facilities that were being built in that part of the world, and then he had to fly back. There was no time for the train and even the plane flight back because of the different hops that had to be made, short range planes, took something like three days. On the plane <coughs> from Novosibirsk to Omsk, he records in his diary having been seated next to a babushka. And the babushka, he said, had firm views, but none of them had been informed by access to the printed word. She was illiterate. And they fell into a conversation. George sort of fell in love with the babushka on the plane. And when the plane got to Omsk, it was a hot day, and they were gathered under the wing of the plane to have lunch on the tarmac. George pulls out his copy of Tolstoy and begins reading aloud in his beautiful classical 19th century Russian to the babushka. And she, of course, is charmed, and she falls in love with him. But so do all the other passengers on the plane who gather around and listen to this reading of Tolstoy. I don't even know what text from Tolstoy it was. George doesn't say it doesn't matter. But the fact that this is attracting this kind of audience uh, in a, a Soviet city on the immediate aftermath of the Soviet Union's greatest victory, the high point of Soviet power at the end of World War II. There is a hunger, there is a culture here that is much more deeply rooted than the Stalin system. This meant a great deal uh, to George. It told him something, I think. It's also, I think, significant <clears throat> that when George Kennan comes back to the United States, uh, shortly thereafter, after sending the famous long telegram from Moscow, this is February of 1946. He is put in charge of designing the curriculum, the first grand strategy curriculum in America at the National War College in Washington. And then he's sent around to speak at American universities. And the first American university at which he speaks, I'm happy to say, was Yale University. 
uh, October 1st, 1946. Uh, but Kennan puzzled the Yaleys by devoting at least a third or more of the speech he gave there that day to Anton Chekhov. Well, why? Uh, this uh, seems very odd on the surface. Until you look at the short story that he was summarizing, until you look at the point he made. The short story is called The New Villa. Uh, it's about the mistress of an estate who wants to build a school on the side of a hill. But the peasants, of course, don't want to uh, uh, change anything. The peasants don't want to go out and work. They are uh, simply resistant and passively uh, object to her uh, plans. And so it goes nowhere. She's walking away disconsolately, but she's followed by an old blacksmith who says, don't despair, mistress. Uh, give them time. Let them come around to the idea themselves of uh, the desirability of having a school. Let it go for two years or three years and just gently remind them of what the benefits of having a school would be. And then some of them on their own initiative would begin to clear the brush away or clear the trees away or clear the rocks away and would be willing to build. And you will have your school in four or five years if you simply let it become their own idea. And that, George told the Yaleys, is what containment was all about. It must become the idea of the inhabitants and the leadership of the Soviet Union that Marxism-Leninism was an unworkable system. It must become their own idea that this system needs to be modified, needs to be reformed. It might become their own idea that this system should be overthrown. But if that happened, that would happen peacefully because it would be they themselves who would be doing it. It would not be outside forces like the United States. There was no way to say how long this would take uh, for that to happen. Uh, Kennan, in other circumstances, predicted perhaps 15 years. <clears throat> took closer to 45 years for this to happen. But I think it's uncanny that at Yale on October 1st, 1946, George Kennan is anticipating the advent of Mikhail Gorbachev, who is himself a kid 13 years old at the time George is making uh, this speech. So this, I think, is powerful testimony to the importance of studying literature and culture in thinking about grand strategy. I'm struck by the extent to which this idea came from those sources, not from the sources uh, that, you, that you might expect. And this mystical connection that existed between George Kennan and Anton Chekhov was something really quite uh, remarkable. Kennan's greatest frustration in life was that he failed to become the biographer of Anton Chekhov. That's what he really wanted to be. He didn't want to be the architect of containment. He wanted to be Chekhov's uh, biographer. Um, he uh, felt extremely emotionally about Chekhov. Some of you may know from the book that George Kennan lost his mother when he was only two months old, and he never got over this. And so in his old age, one day, he was about 98 or 99, uh, Tony and I went to see him in Princeton. Tony was directing Cherry Orchard at that point. They fell into, uh, uh, with Yale undergrads, uh, they fell into a conversation uh, about Chekhov. Kennan started talking about another Chekhov story, uh, The Step, in which a little boy is being taken to school across the Great Step, not knowing where he's going. He's in an ox cart uh, being driven by peasants. The stars above are cold and chilly at night. Uh, the sky is empty. The landscape is devoid of features in the daytime. Uh, and uh, the little boy is alone. And as George was telling us this story at the age of 98, tears were streaming down his cheeks. And then uh, summer before last, Tony and I had the opportunity with a Yale alumni group to visit Yalta. And of course, I lectured on the Yalta conference. But Tony, who has been running the School of Theater at uh, the uh, undergraduate program in theater at Yale, of course, lectured on Chekhov, and of course, stole the show, uh, as you would uh, expect. And we visited Chekhov's house in Yalta, uh, which you can visit if you go there. Uh, 
And it's quite astonishing because you can see the photographs of uh, the house when Chekhov moved into it in what, Tony, 1896 or seven? So thereabouts. Uh, the house is there. Uh, you can see the garden that he is beginning to plant. Uh, which uh, is just coming up to his knees uh, at that point. He's in a frock coat, and the plants are all staked up and whatnot. You go there now, and it's a beautiful garden that has grown up uh, all over the place and overhangs the entire house. And you walk among these trees and plants and bushes. It's a far more uh, moving and impressive place than the Levadia Palace uh, at Yalta, it seems to me. And suddenly you realize here Chekhov was someone who was willing to think, able to think, to visualize 100 years ahead and say, these plants, if located in the right places and nurtured in the right way, would long after my death, because he knew he was dying of tuberculosis at that point, would produce this beautiful garden. That's thinking ahead. That's a kind of horticultural grand strategy. And I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, something like that is what was in George Kennan's mind. I think inspired uh, by Chekhov and the other great writers. When he was going through the critical phase of developing the concept of containment in the mid-1940s, he was thinking, this is a kind of grand strategy also that involves the planting of seeds. <coughs> it involves the patience of someone who plants things and lets them grow. It involves no violent movements, but it does involve perhaps nudging things a little bit here so that maybe they will grow in this direction, and nudging things a little bit here so that they will grow in that direction. Um, and above all, it involves patience and the ability to see what something might look like um, decades into the future. That was the genius of George Kennan, and that is what I tried to capture uh, in this book. So uh, with thanks for your attention, I will stop with this and see if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Gaddis. Uh, with apologies for doing the worst possible thing to a historian, and that is to force you into the present. Uh, I'm, uh, I feel compelled to ask, though, about uh, what, Kenan, what you think Kennan might think uh, about some of the present approach uh, to uh, the American dilemmas of foreign policy. Uh, uh, both the current administration and the previous have followed a version mm -hmm. of the grand strategy, arguably, mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in terms of the Middle East and the, the enemies of mm -hmm. America, uh, waiting on uh, mm -hmm. waiting on the people of other mm -hmm. countries, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but not so much. I don't imagine a lot of CIA analysts spend a great deal of time trying to understand the uh, literature that Osama bin Laden mm -hmm. once read. I, I'm mm -hmm. not sure, uh, but. How do you think Kennan would uh, react to the present dilemma? Well, I don't know what the CIA analysts are um, reading, but I hope they are paying some attention to some of that literature. And I think they probably uh, are, whether they're paying as much attention as Kennan would have done with Russian literature. I have, I have no idea. But uh, I've always tried to be a little bit careful with uh, trying to put words in the mouth of George Kennan. He is dead. He has been dead now for some number of years, I think, biographers really do have a responsibility to uh, be reticent and cautious about trying to say uh, the subject of my biography, whoever it is, whether it's George Kennan or Julius Caesar, would have thought, thought the following about current uh, developments in the Gaza Strip or something like that. So I try to refrain from that. I do think this, though. Um, Kennan always stressed that the idea of containment would not have worked with Nazi Germany. Uh, he said it would work with the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union had a scientific view of history, quote, unquote. They viewed the forces of history as being on their side. And so there was no timetable about achieving uh, the victory of proletarians throughout the world. But it would happen. It was historically inevitable. <coughs> Hitler had a, a different view. He had no system of history as such. He had a personal conviction that uh, Germany could indeed dominate Europe, and perhaps more than uh, Europe. Uh, 
but that this could only happen uh, if he himself personally led this. And Hitler was convinced he was going to have a short life. He was right about that. He was also convinced that only he had the fortitude uh, and the vision to lead. So uh, containment, buying time, Kennan always argued, would not have worked with Hitler. With Stalin, it was a different matter. Now that would suggest for any of the crises in the present that we should be looking at and thinking about the option of containment with reference to. The question, do we have time? Is time on our side? Are the internal contradictions within some other society of sufficient magnitude that they will of their own accord bring that country around to changing its viewpoint? Or are these countries that really are prepared to commit suicide because of their belief in a cause and whatnot? Uh, that's the critical question, it seems to me, that confronts us in the Middle East and elsewhere. And if I had an answer to it, uh, I would long since have given up my professorship at Yale uh, and uh, taken a position perhaps even in the CIA, who knows. Uh, but uh, I don't have an answer to it. It's complex. I think the answer is there are both kinds of leaders in the Middle East now. I do think, however, that there is a tendency for states to think about their futures. Uh, I'm not sure terrorists think about their futures because by definition, they uh, quite often uh, uh, glory in not having a future. And so that might be a distinction that one could make uh, between, uh, for example, the terrorists of Al Qaeda and 9-11 and the current regime in Iran. But this is not one that I would want to push too far. I would simply say I think it's very important to try to do this kind of analysis of the internal dynamics of any society. And that really deeply does uh, involve knowing something about the culture of that society. Well, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. Um, I had a question about your understanding of Kennan. So bef when you first agreed to write the biography, um, you probably had some image in mind of what kind of an in individual um, George Kennan was. But um, after you obtained permission or access to his personal diaries, how did this understanding change? Was it a profound change? Or um, did you learn anything new about him? Mm -hmm. Oh, I learned all kinds of things new about him. His middle name was Frost. And a lot of people thought that characterized his personality. I mean, uh, actually, uh, he was not given that name as a baby because he was expected to be Frosty. It was not that. Uh, the next door neighbors were named Frost. But anyway, people who did not know him always made a big deal of his Frosty uh, middle name. In fact, <clears throat> to get to know him, uh, was a, a delight and a pleasure. He was a gentleman. He was um, considerate uh, in unfailingly uh, polite, often hilariously funny. Uh, you wouldn't think this from the public uh, image. He could be tedious because he believed so strongly in certain things that dinner table conversations could be dominated by his views on this or that. And once he got going, it was like his proverbial boulder rolling down a hill. It was very, you just got out of the way. You couldn't uh, stop it. Uh, but with all that, uh, a delight and a joy and a pleasure uh, to know. And uh, someone who had a great sense of, um, a great sense of honor and responsibility. Uh, so our deal was that uh, he would never read a line of my book. On the occasion of his 100th birthday, uh, which was February 1904, at Princeton, I was doing the keynote address uh, on that occasion, and George was too feeble at that point to come to the ceremony. But I went to see him upstairs in his bedroom uh, at his house in Princeton. And he knew that I was doing the keynote address, and he said very sheepishly, very tentatively, he said, do you think that I could see a copy of the keynote address that you're going to give on the occasion of my 100th birthday. And I said, of course, George, I'll, I'll send it to you. And he said, but don't, don't do it if you think it's going to compromise the integrity of the biography. <laughs> and that's very characteristic of George Kennan, for sure. Yeah, Professor, what do you think uh, Kennan would have seen in the Russian character that reflects, that is, inf that would inform us today mm -hmm. with respect of um, the culture's admiration for strong men and the mm -hmm. rise of oligarchs and uh, mafia, right. the plutocracy mm -hmm. today. 
Um, he would not have been surprised at all by this because he would know how deeply rooted that tendency is uh, in uh, Russian culture. He would actually, I'm sure, have been greatly pleased uh, by the revival of the Russian Orthodox Church. He was deeply interested in it. Had there been a Russian Orthodox Church in Princeton, I think Kennan would have joined it instead of the Presbyterians. Uh, and um, so there would be much that while he would not necessarily try to defend, at the same time, he would say, I understand uh, where this is coming from. He would never have believed that it could be uh, a successful American project to transplant democracy into Russia. But of course, he believed the same thing about most of the rest of the, of the world uh, as well. So uh, there would be little that would surprise him. One of the positions that he did take, uh, in the last really very firm position that he took on a public issue, was to oppose the expansion of NATO in the 1990s because he foresaw that this would certainly alienate uh, the Russians. He hoped that we would have an amicable relationship with the Russian, but it would not be an amicable relationship based on a compatibility of internal systems. It would be uh, uh, an amicable relationship based on mutual restraint within the international system and his objection to Stalin and to uh, Stalin's successors was that Stalin was not inclined to show that mutual, that degree of restraint within the international system. Thank you, Professor Gaddis. Um, I wonder if, uh, if Kennan's perspective on Soviet intentions and Soviet character and what appropriate US foreign policy toward the Soviet Union changed with Soviet behaviors, Soviet foreign, foreign policy mm -hmm. behaviors or internal developments within the Soviet Union mm -hmm. over time, especially mm -hmm. leading up to uh, yes. the development of the, of uh -huh. the containment doctrine. Well, there was a big change that took place after the development of the containment doctrine. I don't think his views changed very much before the development of that doctrine. He was always a skeptic as to whether we could have a um, normal relationship with a state like Soviet, the Soviet Union. But one of the great cosmic, seismic events in his life and in his thinking was the development of, of nuclear weapons. And in this case, not so much atomic weapons, but the thermonuclear weapons that were successfully tested in the 1950s, a thousand times more powerful than the A-bombs that devastated Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <coughs> Kennan became adamantly convinced uh, that uh, the world would be destroyed if there were a war uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union in which these weapons were used. He became so terrified of this prospect that whereas back in the 1940s he was prepared to say that we should do certain things to make life more difficult uh, for the Russians, uh, we should uh, do the Marshall Plan. We should undertake covert operations. Uh, Kennan is the architect of the original concept of covert operations within the, uh, within the CIA. We should seek to strain the Soviet relationship with the East European satellites. Uh, he said all of those things in the 1940s. Yeah, by the time uh, of the mid-1950s, he is prepared, uh, not prepared to say that at all. His tendency is to say, we cannot rock the boat. We just, uh, uh, it's too dangerous. And so for the last half of his life, he becomes, I say this candidly uh, in the book, he becomes an apologist for many aspects of the Soviet regime. Not because he approves of them, but because he sees so vividly what the danger of war would be uh, that uh, he thinks we cannot risk uh, anything. And this was the basis for his uh, really visceral uh, hatred of Ronald Reagan, who he saw as taking these risks uh, in the most dangerous possible uh, way. The great irony in that is that Ronald Reagan's views actually were far closer to those of George Kennan than any other American president, because Reagan was himself a nuclear abolitionist, the only one to be president of the United States, because Reagan himself accepted the notion that the Cold War need not last forever. That was one of the original premises of the original Kennan uh, strategy. Uh, and because Reagan uh, took the view that the internal contradictions within the Soviet Union, if uh, uh, put under a strain and some pressure, that uh, th there would be a Soviet leader that would come along and would change uh, the system. 
And uh, ironically, uh, Reagan is, is therefore closer in grand strategy to Kennan than any other American president. But Kennan's fear of nuclear war so blinded him to what Reagan was doing that he was completely uh, irrational on that subject. I, I knew him by then and was trying to persuade him that interesting things were going on in Washington, but I got nowhere with it. So that's the big change in his views, the importance of, of nuclear weapons uh, and his own ecological thinking, I would call it. He was one of the first serious environmental thinkers. But that environmental concern for the fate of the Earth, long before Jonathan Shell had written that book, uh, in fact, uh, does change his sense of the extent to which we should try to exploit the, uh, the uh, contradictions within the Soviet system. Just following up briefly on that, did, uh, did Kennan acknowledge after the events of the 1980s, would he have acknowledged that uh, unexpectedly to him that, that Reagan's pressure on the Soviets played some sort of precipitant final role? He only acknowledged this to my knowledge once. And um, this was during the preparation of the CNN television documentary, Cold War, uh, which was done in the 90s. And because George hated television, uh, the producers tasked me to go persuade him to be interviewed. And he agreed to be interviewed only if I would do the interview. Because he, uh, he said, I won't look good on television. They'll put makeup on me. Uh, they'll uh, you know, bring cables across the floor of the office. They'll knock over chairs and all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> so I finally persuaded him to sit for the interview with the following argument. Uh, he was, had just finished a book on Bismarck. And I said, George, if you were to suddenly be presented with access to a videotape of Bismarck being interviewed, are you telling me that you would not condescend to look at it? And at that point, he caved and agreed to be interviewed. Uh, one of what the producers wanted me to ask, who was most responsible for ending uh, the Cold War? And I said, let's don't waste time on that. I know what he's going to say, Gorbachev. And they said, ask him anyway. So I asked him, and he said, Gorbachev, as I expected. And then he got a very strange look in his eye. And I think he was watching to see if I would fall off my chair when I, <laughs> he said this. But, he said, this is 1996, but he said, and Ronald Reagan, who, perhaps without quite knowing what he was doing, <laughs> played a very important role in bringing this conflict uh, to an end. Well, of course, we know from the documents now that Reagan knew perfectly well what he was doing. Uh, but that's as far as George ever came. Thank you, Professor. I've mm -hmm. uh, been fascinated by the George F. Kennan, The American Life, um, that, uh, that is the title of your book, and the George F. Kennan who has this deep, abiding love for Russian culture. Um, it seems to me not characteristic of our strongest and most respected American leaders now to have such a deep understanding of foreign cultures. Do you think that there are more George Kennans coming as leaders of America? Or do you think that um, the way we've moved um, as a country, no longer rewards people who um, have the kind of understanding that George Kennan did. I think it's very tough for somebody like that to come forward uh, within the American system, within two different American systems, I would say. One is the government itself, which is so much bigger than it was back then. And so when I speak at the State Department or even at the policy planning staff, which George was the first director of, that's a question I get. Could any of us become a George Kennan? And I have to say, I don't think so, because the State Department is so big now and so impersonal. And part of the success of his career was that there were superiors who knew him, who respected him, who tolerated him. And when he would threaten to resign, which he did seven times uh, at one time or another, they would talk him out of it. And I just don't think that would happen uh, today with the same care and nurturing that it did back then. The other uh, institution which I think ill prepares uh, leaders uh, for uh, this kind of position are our universities, I'm sad to say. And I think the tendency toward over-specialization within the university system, the tendency, particularly at the level of undergraduate education, to lose sight of what, a, what the liberal arts really are and for professors simply to teach their dissertations to undergrads, which creates compartmentalization and disconnection and no sense of how things relate to anything else. That is a huge problem 
within the American university system. It's a huge problem at my university. <coughs> and th this is one of the reasons, <coughs> excuse me, why uh, my colleagues, uh, Paul Kennedy and Charlie Hill and I have created uh, the Grand Strategy course at Yale, which really is based on uh, the George Kennan curriculum at the National War College the study of the great classical works in relation to current policy, the combination of that with practical experience out in the world, and then uh, training in how you put these two things together, practical experience and the um, wisdom of the classics, with reference to very specific issues like these that we've been discussing, what to do about the Arab Spring, what to do about Russia, what to do about the fiscal crisis. So we're trying to do something like this, and other universities are trying to do things like this as well. But I wouldn't say it's a movement yet. I hope it becomes a movement. I think it's badly uh, needed, because uh, I think it's to the universities that we're going to have to look to train people uh, like this. And then if we can train them, and they demonstrate their uh, uh, knowledge, their capability, then places will be found in government for them, it seems to me, and in other organizations. But the universities have got to start that process, and I think that's where reform is needed now. Th thank you. I, I can't resist the following question in light of that answer. Okay. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences has a commission chartered by Congress to think about the top 10 things that we should do to strengthen the health of humanities, <coughs> education, and research across the country. Uh, in addition to the items that you just ticked off, do you have anything else that quickly comes to mind on the federal side uh, in particular? Well, I gave you three. Uh, and, uh, uh, three is, uh, if you just do three of those, I'll be happy. <laughs> I'll, I'll just reinforce what the, the whole drift of what I'm trying to say today is that the classics are critically important. Uh, these insights that Kennan got came from the classics of uh, Russian literature in the 19th century. Uh, the reason people read the classics, the reason people keep going back and reading the classics, all the way back to Thucydides and Sun Tzu and Polybius and uh, Machiavelli and Clausewitz, is that uh, different ages across time and space, but also different cultures, have found things immensely valuable in them. We should not lightly discard those things. We should not lightly discard those texts. Part of the problem in teaching them is that you can never specify what the payoff is going to be if you teach Thucydides to a young person. Uh, and so it's very difficult to uh, explain this to deans and boards of trustees who are looking for instant measurement on what you have learned from studying the Peloponnesian War. It's hard to do that. But on the other hand, uh, if you uh, accept that a young person is going to confront uncertain futures, none of us can tell what kind of futures they are going to uh, confront. And if we can simply equip them with some exposure to the classics, very much as you might uh, equip them with training in athletics for games, the nature of which cannot be anticipated, but the training we know in athletics is critically important. Why don't we know this within the university, within our intellectual world? That's the question I would ask. Another uh, thinker and writer of that period was <coughs> Hedrick Smith, who uh, was the top correspondent mm -hmm. of the New York Times, mm -hmm. lived in Moscow and Russia for a long period mm -hmm. of time. I read his book, The Russians. Sure. His view was very much that communism was so much a part of the fiber of the country mm -hmm. and the family. Mm -hmm. It was the religion. It, it was so superseded the family structure that children would mm -hmm. tell mm -hmm. on their parents. Mm -hmm. His sense was that the that Soviet Union would not collapse mm -hmm. and that it was going to go on as a horror forever. I well, wonder, did, did Kennan know him? Did they, I wonder what your view I'm sure they knew one. each other. I don't know whether they were close, but of course that book was written, what, 30 years ago, 35 years ago. That book was written at the high point of Soviet influence, and uh, Smith was not alone in thinking about this. I have just been reading, uh, really for the first time, Whitaker Chambers' great book, Witness, his great memoir, published in the early 60s. Uh, and Chambers is convinced that uh, the Soviets and communism is going, to, is going to win. It's one of the most devastating critiques of communism ever written, and yet it's written as um, 
the uh, last gasp of someone who is drowning. Uh, and he's convinced that that's where the world is going to go. So part of the history of this whole period is how it happened <clears throat> that so many uh, intelligent people, George Orwell, a very good example. Uh, you could almost say J.R.R. Tolkien and the very pessimistic view that animated uh, Lord of the Rings, which is both Nazism and fascism, that sense of pessimism uh, was pervasive in our culture in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and even to some extent into the 60s. What happened to it? That's the great task for the cultural historians, it seems to me, to try to explain better to us. For sure. Yes, Professor Garrett, so you've given a very eloquent, <coughs> and I, I completely agree with your characterization of Kennan's view of the impact of the H-bomb. My question is, how would you compare the impact of that to the death of Stalin on Kennan's thinking? Because it seems to me that also is quite significant and to some extent is interwoven mm -hmm. with the impact of the H-bomb in terms of how he describes the impact of that death and, and a mm -hmm. partial de-Stalinization mm -hmm. on the nature mm -hmm. of the system and threat that the United States now faces mm -hmm. after 1953. Yeah. They're both almost parallel with each other. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, Kennan did expect that Stalin would die uh, at some point, <laughs> in contrast to what most of us think about Fidel Castro now. Uh, but, uh, be, and, and it is the case that in time, uh, the Soviet acquisition of the H-bomb coincided almost, it's the same year basically as, as Stalin's uh, death. Uh, so Kennan did see the likelihood that there might be moderation among Stalin's uh, successors, and he was uh, noticing this, he was pointing it out, uh, but felt there wasn't much we could do about it under the Khrushchev period. Uh, and later he becomes even more optimistic under the Brezhnev period to the point <clears throat> that when the great dissidents, Solzhenitsyn and Sakharov begin to emerge in the 1970s, far from supporting them, Kennan is opposing them because he thinks that they are, again, rocking the boat in this regard. Uh, so th this was one of the great contradictions in Kennan's thinking. He saw the possibility that the Soviet Union could evolve, but at the same time he came to consider the evolution itself as extremely dangerous because uh, the nuclear weapons had made any change in the system uh, so, uh, so dangerous. I'm, I think he exaggerated that danger, but again, who is to say? Because he could have been right. We came very close in several situations, and the more we learn, the more risky some of those situations uh, are. So I, you know, I can be critical of him for uh, that attitude, but not too critical, because I think in his own sense, in his own way, this was his great sense of responsibility, which was often wider than that of most other people in public life, for sure. Professor Geddes, yes, uh, a quick question uh, before we take another from the mm -hmm. audience. The, uh, Frank Castigliola, a scholar you uh, mm -hmm. acknowledge in the book, uh, had a recent book in which he described the, the immediate post-war period uh, in a way that essentially uh, offered up that the Cold War was accelerated and worsened in many respects mm -hmm. uh, by the rise of Truman and uh, presents Truman as uh, something of a cultural boob mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, who fails in his interactions mm -hmm. with Stalin in a way that, uh, mm -hmm. that Roosevelt was not. Uh, what was Kennan's view on that sequence of events and whether that's a fair, mm -hmm. uh, fair attribution to Truman's role? Kennan would not have agreed with Professor Castigliola on that point, nor would I. Uh, this is far too simple. <clears throat> uh, it ignores everything that we know about Stalin. Uh, the idea that somehow by being nice to Stalin, you could get him to be nice to you, is contradicted by every aspect that we know of Stalin's life. Uh, and uh, so, um, to me, this just doesn't uh, fit uh, at all. But it could have been worse. I mean. We could have very easily had Henry Wallace as president of the United States <laughs> uh, if FDR had not made a critical decision in the summer of 1944. And so there you are. On the human and by the way, uh, Oliver Stone has just come out with a documentary pushing that one step further and saying, if only Henry Wallace had been, become president of the United States, the Cold War would not have happened. That's even more ridiculous in my view. <laughs> Sorry. On the human side, Professor Gaddis, uh, what I like so much about your book is the way with George Kennan's strong views mm 
uh, he is part of a group of friends as well as associates mm -hmm. in Washington, Marshall and Atchison, and sure. uh, so, who tolerate his, what they must have thought of as, as eccentricities, Absolutely. but really uh, mm -hmm. loved his sincerity mm -hmm. and his insight. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little on that? Well, he was part of a group, and groups, of course, are very interesting to study. Evan Thomas and Walter Isaacson wrote the classic book on this almost 30 years ago with their book, The Wise Men, uh, on that particular group. But if you were to ask Kennan, he would never have said, I feel that I'm part of a group. He always said, I'm alone. I don't fit in, uh, in for whatever reason. And I think some of this was deeply psychological, the loss of his mom when he was uh, so young. Uh, some of it was where he was from. He was not an East Coast establishment uh, figure. He's from Milwaukee. Some of it was the fact, little known by most people, that he had very little money. Uh, uh, they were on the verge of poverty right up until uh, 1950 or so when he goes to Princeton. They lost their money in the, in the Depression. There were just all kinds of reasons, apart from his views, which were also uh, often at odds with uh, high-level uh, thinking in Washington, uh, that led him to this sense of uh, loneliness. And so while people see him as part of a group, the more I worked on this book, the more I came to think that he was truly a lonely individual indeed, uh, and that um, his ability to work with those around him was actually fairly limited in time. It uh, worked, he was able to work with colleagues in the Foreign Service when he was younger. He worked very well with Marshall. But most of the rest of the time, uh, his relationship with his own colleagues, even though they respected him, was a relationship that had so much friction in it that in the end, when he decided to leave the State Department, go to Princeton, become a, a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study, most of his friends said, this is the right thing to do. The period uh, 1946 into the early 50s was very full of adventure around the world. Um, while the containment policy was being put in place in Europe, things began to go a bit south, one might say, in Asia. Mm -hmm. How does the Korean War fit into this theory of Kennan's, and did the theory uh, have any staying power, mm -hmm. say, right into Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Well, the Korean War is a real problem for Kennan because Kennan said that um, we must identify the vital strong points uh, and not try to defend everything out there uh, in the world. And for him, that meant the centers of industrial military power. So that would be Japan, would be uh, Germany, it would be Britain, obviously the United States, try to keep these out of uh, Soviet control. But uh, he also said the key to making containment work is regaining psychological self-confidence. So when the attack on Korea, uh, South Korea happened in June of 1950, he was caught both ways. Uh, it was a blitzkrieg attack like those of Hitler and the Japanese, but it was against a country that could hardly be uh, designated an industrial military center. South Korea was a totally agricultural country at that point. There was no question in George's mind, we had to come to the assistance of South Korea. Uh, and he's one of the first uh, to say this. And what he was thinking about was the loss of confidence elsewhere in the world. So this was really the fatal flaw in his own grand strategy. It's all very well to say that you can select certain areas in the world that you will defend and write off other areas in the world. But what if writing them off, and particularly what if writing them off publicly, encourages somebody to attack one of those regions, and then what about the psychological consequences of this? They can be serious. And Korea uh, really illustrated that contradiction in his thinking. Dr. Gaddis, a, a very interesting talk. I Thank appreciate you. it very much. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't come here expecting to learn that uh, the theory of containment was based, at least in part, on uh, their, the, the Russian culture and the value of Russian culture. Do you think that you would have reached that interpretation if you had not yourself been heavily grounded in the great literature and in literature generally, and had you not had that, would you have missed that point? Or 
What was your relation to literature as you entered the area of studying history? Mm -hmm. Well, I would not say that I have any great uh, competency or familiarity with this literature beyond what most other people um, have. Um, <clears throat> so it really was uh, simply going through his own notebooks and diaries uh, to, and talking with him uh, to gain this. I will also say that um, until I met uh, Tony, uh, my wife, I had always been immensely bored by Chekhov because it seemed to me nothing ever happened in those plays or short stories. <laughs> and uh, watching Tony direct Chekhov has profoundly changed my view on this. And I'm sure that has opened up, for me, uh, George Kennan's enthusiasm for Chekhov as well. Thank you, Professor Gaddis. I'm writing a biography of my uncle, former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark, mm -hmm. who turns 85 next mm -hmm. month mm -hmm. and who I fully expect to live to be 101. And I'm wondering how important you think it is to separate the subject from the book and how your book would have been different had you written it and allowed Mr. Kennan to see it? Um, I, I would have been very much intimidated, uh, I think, to say some of the things that I said, because I would, not that I would believe they were wrong or that they were inaccurate or anything like that, but just that I would be worried about how he would be likely to respond to these things. And I didn't want to have to worry about that. I didn't want to have the feeling that he was looking over my shoulder uh, as, I, as I did this. And I felt very strongly about this. Uh, really from watching uh, the, the several other authorized biographical projects where the subject of the biography did insist on looking over the shoulder of uh, the authors. Uh, uh, Averill Harriman was n notorious for this. And Averill Harriman was a formidable figure to be looking over your shoulder when you're trying to write a, a biography. So uh, that was absolutely fundamental, my own uh, independence. The, uh, great luck that I had was that it was, it, uh, it, I had no trouble convincing George Kennan of this, the importance of this. Because many people forget that in the second half of his life, he was himself a historian. That's what he was doing at the Institute for Advanced Study. And he understood the importance of this independent voice. Uh, that you cannot be worrying about what other people, uh, particularly people who are involved in the events themselves, uh, might think. So I had no trouble, whatever, uh, convincing him of this. And as I say, he stuck uh, uh, rigidly, uh, totally, to this agreement for uh, the 25 years that he lived after we made uh, the deal. Just a bit more on that, on the writing process, yes. though. Did the... Uh, uh, after this long period of time in which you obviously mm -hmm. achieved a real intimacy mm -hmm. uh, with him on a very individual, personal mm -hmm. level, uh, you deal delicately with some of the uh, personal mm -hmm. uh, indiscretions that have been mm -hmm. ascribed to his life in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but there must have been some sense of, uh, of concern, a heightened sense of concern about those issues and whether mm -hmm. they really related to his legacy. Mm -hmm. how, how, did you, mm -hmm. how did you work with those, uh, those aspects of his life? You've put this delicately, but are you talking about the affairs? I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, well, it's an interesting story because uh, the evidence for the affairs is in the diaries, uh, not by name of the individual concern, but by uh, expressions of anguish, uh, recurring uh, expressions of anguish on his part, that he felt he had uh, uh, not been loyal in his marriage, that he was reproaching himself for these uh, things. I did feel a sense, uh, and this is, this is an interesting angle of doing authorized biography, where are the limits of privacy? How far do you go? And I did draw the line right here. And I never actually sat down with him and said, George, tell me what's going on here. Uh, because I really thought it would put him in an awkward position. I thought it would put me in an awkward position. And I thought it would um, actually make the other questions, and maybe the more significant questions that we had to deal with, uh, more difficult to deal with if we got off into these um, things. What happened? was that I uh, deliberately waited to publish the book until after his death. 
And sure enough, after his death, uh, people began to talk about this, notably members of his own family who acknowledged uh, uh, this. And as they acknowledged uh, this, I could put the references that I had seen in the diary uh, together. It's just a matter of putting two and two together. And so to this day, I don't know the names of the people with whom he had uh, the affairs. But I can say that I have had uh, several nice letters from ladies who have praised the eloquence of the book as well as its discretion. <laughs> uh, Professor, before we run out of time, I want to ask a question coming from uh, a viewer uh, on the internet uh, who's slightly frustrated with you because she emailed uh, an earlier question which you've already answered. Uh, well played, Professor, says uh, Morgan Byrne Diakon here at UVA. Right. But then she asks, uh, Kenan does not seem very worried about time in terms mm -hmm. of application of containment. Mm -hmm. Did he consider the USSR an imminent military threat? In other words, were there circumstances in which Kenan might have said that containment, containment would no longer be applicable militarily? Mm -hmm. Not with respect to the Soviet Union, because he never believed that the Soviet Union would actually launch a uh, military attack in Western Europe. He did fully believe, particularly after the Korean War broke out, that the Soviet Union was capable of, of authorizing proxy forces <coughs> to attack exposed positions here and there. But he never expected that the Red Army was going to come crashing through the Fulda uh, Gap. And uh, people would ask him, how do you know that they won't uh, do this? And of course, he had no basis for hard knowledge here because this is pre-reconnaissance satellites. Uh, so we really know very little about Soviet military dispositions and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and Kennan himself, I think, would have been the first to say that he was not an expert on military dispositions uh, in the first place. He would simply fall back and say, uh, trust me on this. I'm a Russian expert. Um, he was right. Uh, trust me because, first of all, the devastation of the war that they had suffered between uh, 1941 and 45 was such that there was no imminent danger that they would risk this again. But secondly, trust me because their own ideology persuaded them that they could get what they wanted without war. And that was the long-term view of the importance of ideology, something that many of us, I think, underestimated before the Soviet documents came out, the, really, the critical importance of ideology in shaping the thinking of Soviet and other uh, Marxist leaders uh, throughout the world. So it was on the basis of these things, plus one other thing that I think is pretty critical, although it was kind of a leap of faith on George's part. George was also a great student of Edward Gibbon and had read the decline and fall of the Roman Empire on airplanes going across the Atlantic during the war. It took a long time for airplanes to get across, so you had to bring a long book along to, to read. And one of the things that Gibbon had said in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire was that the tendency, he talked about the tendency of empires to overexpand themselves, to extend their periphery, and then to have weak spots along the periphery where they could be attacked. So it happened repeatedly uh, to the Romans, and he said it's a characteristic of all empires. And so he believed this is what would happen to Hitler's empire in time. Uh, and he believed, uh, he was convinced it would happen to Stalin's empire uh, as well. That expansion into Eastern Europe would ultimately be a source of weakness, uh, not a source of strength uh, to the Soviet Union. Now, I don't think Stalin read Gibbon, but I do think that Stalin came to understand fairly quickly that Eastern Europe was no source of strength uh, because you have to remember, Stalin really expected the East Europeans enthusiastically to welcome Marxism. Uh, that's what the law of history said. And so when it becomes clear that that's not happening, and of course it becomes clearer after Stalin's death with the rebellions in East Berlin in 53 and then Poland and Hungary in 56, Prague 68, these are devastating for uh, people who believed in a scientific approach to, to, to history. Uh, and Kennan, um, fully anticipated that this, this kind of thing would happen, and it was based really on his uh, reading of Gibbon. He, his favorite quotation, one of his favorite quotations, was Gibbon, there is nothing more difficult than to hold enthralled conquered provinces indefinitely. Mm -hmm.